For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask to address the House for one minute for the purpose of inquiring about next week's schedule. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. I thank the Speaker. And, Madam Speaker, I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, the Majority Leader, for the purpose of announcing next week's schedule. I thank the gentleman for yielding. On Monday, the House will meet at 12.30 uh, p.m. for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business with votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday, the House will meet at 10.30 a.m. for morning hour debate and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Wednesday and Thursday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for legislative business. And on Friday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. We will consider several bills under suspension of the rules. The complete list of suspension bills, as is the custom, will be announced at the close of business today. In addition uh, to the suspension bills, we will also consider the 2010 Energy and Water Development and Related Agencies Appropriation Act and the 2010 Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Act. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Madam Speaker, uh, this is our first colloquy since the July 4th recess, and we are scheduled to be in session for three more weeks before the next recess. So, Madam Speaker, I'd ask the gentleman if he could give us, give us a sense of what will be considered on the floor beyond uh, next week, and I yield. Well, I expect to uh, uh, complete the appropriations bills, uh, and I also, uh, uh, the uh, large item that will be on the agenda uh, is the health care uh, legislation that we hope to pass before we leave on the August break. And prior to that, I intend to have uh, on the floor a provision uh, dealing uh, with statutory pay go. We have not yet determined exactly uh, uh, whether that bill will be freestanding or whether it will be uh, uh, on another bill that would be reported uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the House. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, food safety bill is possible. Uh, the uh, uh, our committees are still working on other uh, matters, uh, and uh, we hope to have the food safety uh, issue resolved. There are a number of other committees that came out of the Energy and Commerce Committee, but there are a number of other committees, including the Ag Committee and your own committee, ways and means that have uh, expressed interest in that. Uh, the, uh, uh, those are essentially the items that we intend to deal with between now and the August break. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Madam Speaker, the Senate is in session one week longer. It's, it's scheduled to be in session one week longer than we are here in the House. And I'd ask the gentleman if he expects us or anticipates our working into August as the Senate is scheduled to do, and I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. As the gentleman, I think, knows, because I think he got a preliminary schedule from my office, which had us working the first week in August. Uh, I received uh, comments from both sides of the aisle from a lot of uh, members who have young children, school-aged children. And one of the realities is we called around the country, and uh, schools are going back into session anywhere between August 15th and August 25th, some later, but a lot of the schools and members, uh, as I say, on both sides of the aisle were concerned that if we did not break on July 31st, that they would be unable to have uh, a vacation with their children uh, uh, during the summer months. And as a result, we concluded that we would uh, end our uh, session on the 31st, a week before the Senate had concluded. Originally, as I say, it was... Uh, we were both scheduled to be in the first week of August. Uh, obviously, as the gentleman knows, the good news is we are able to get our work done uh, because of our rules uh, more quickly than the Senate can get its rules done. So we think that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish within the time frame available. I thank the gentleman. And speaking of rules, um, I want to first of all thank the gentleman uh, for the ongoing dialogue uh, that he and I have had over the last several weeks uh, regarding how the House will go forward in terms of deliberating on appropriations bills. And I sincerely express my gratitude for his engagement, his patience, uh, the back and forth. And I know that we have been unsuccessful thus far in getting to what I believe is a mutual, mutually desirable goal, which is to return to the precedence of the House in terms of open rules surrounding appropriations bills. And, Madam Speaker, I'd say to the gentleman, he has noticed two appropriate bills for next week, 
and I would like to ask him what kind of rules does he expect these bills uh, to be considered under, and I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank him for his observation with respect to trying to work together uh, to uh, reach uh, an agreement under which we would have a confidence that we could consider the appropriation bills within the time frame available to us. Uh, I, I, we are on a good schedule now. As you know, we have passed seven of the uh, 12 bills uh, from the House. We have five more uh, left to go. Uh, my uh, expectation is we will complete those. The uh, two bills that are uh, – let me, let me say that uh, – uh, he and I have now been talking, I think, for somewhere in the neighborhood about three and a half months uh, about this issue. Uh, I made a proposal early on that, from my perspective, did two things. One, it provided for time frames in which we would consider legislation, and B, provided to the, uh, uh, to, uh, the minority party, uh, which does not control the Rules Committee. We were both in that situation for a period of time, uh, but nevertheless provide uh, – uh, the, your party with the opportunity to offer such amendments as it deemed uh, desirable, that it wanted to uh, offer. With respect to the specific uh, two bills that you uh, asked me about, I have not had an opportunity to discuss with Mr. Obie or with the uh, subcommittee chairs of those uh, two committees uh, the specific rule that they are uh, looking for uh, and whether or not they've been able to reach any agreements uh, with their counterparts. Uh, the ranking members uh, on those two subcommittees. So I can't answer your question at this point in time, but uh, as we have had discussions, I want those discussions to continue. Uh, I will say to my friend that I had a, a discussion with one of your members who's on the Appropriations Committee today who came over to this side of the aisle. We were talking about it, uh, again, with a continuing effort to see if there's some way we can provide for the objectives of, uh, I think, both of us. I yield oh. back. Madam Speaker, I thank the gentleman. I do want to again express my gratitude for his belief as a former appropriator uh, that we ought to be operating under open rules and an open process uh, when we are talking about deliberating and executing our constitutionally mandated role of expending and authorizing taxpayer dollars. Uh, and I do know that the gentleman shares uh, my belief that we ought to get there. Uh, and I do also know, and the gentleman has been very forthright in telling me and uh, the leader on our side about his desire to want to get the work done of the people. Uh, I don't think that we disagree on trying to get the work done. I do believe, though, that we do owe to the American public uh, the ability to see our work and the ability to have a full discussion uh, on the separate issues that surround each appropriations bill. And as the gentleman knows even more than, uh, more than many in this House, as he has served here and on the Appropriations Committee, the precedence of the House is open rule. And he and I have had discussion about what perhaps our party did when it was in the majority. And during the Republican majority, the most appropriations bills ever to be considered under a restrictive rule during any one year was in 1997 when there were four bills discussed under a restricted rule, uh, and that again was in 1997. So far this year, as a gentleman knows, is his party in the majority. There have been six bills that have been uh, deliberated and discussed and debated under a restricted rule, and we seemingly are on track for 12. So again, I know that the gentleman in his discussions with me, and we agree that we need to be under an open process. But as the gentleman has told me, it is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, that has basically overruled nearly all of us here in the House. Uh, and essentially, uh, Madam Speaker, it seems that the gentleman who is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee uh, closed down the process again this week, prevented members on our side and the other from exercising their constitutional duties while disenfranchising the millions of American citizens that they represent. So I, for the life of me, don't understand how it is that any individual, much less the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, is content to spend the taxpayer dollars without allowing there to be a full and open debate. 
And in fact, Madam Speaker, I would point the gentleman, the majority leader's attention to a, a quote from the gentleman from Wisconsin from October 6, 2000, when Mr. Obey of Wisconsin said, in, in the context of discussing the need for open and full debate, quote, we have gotten so far from regular order that I fear that if this continues, the House will not have the capacity to return to its precedents and procedures of the House that have given true meaning to the term representative democracy. He went on to say the reason that we have stuck to regular order as long as we have in this institution is to protect the rights, is to protect the rights of every member to participate. And we lose those rights. We lose the right to be called the greatest deliberative body left in the world. And I say that, and I bring that to the gentleman's attention for exactly the point that what he and I have been trying to achieve. Let's open up the process. And again, bearing in mind, Madam Speaker, the gentleman's goal of trying to finish the work, I know that he knows I've represented, I will do all we can, and we on this side feel that we can meet his time frame. So I would say and ask the gentleman if, if he is still in the posture of being able to deliver uh, the ability for us to have uh, the, the, the choice of the amendments that we offer. So is it that if we were to now say, and I'm willing to offer this to the gentleman, if we were to say, fine, as the gentleman suggested two months ago outside the precedence of the House, if we were to agree to time limits, then uh, we could have the ability to offer the amendments and have full and open discussion uh, on the appropriations bills uh, as he had asked several months ago, and I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. First of all, the gentleman puts a lot of thoughts and words into my mouth that aren't necessarily there. Uh, let me say to the gentleman, as he knows, uh, some three and a half months ago, I did in fact come to the gentleman. I subsequently came to the leader and, and indicated that I thought that we could uh, uh, reach agreement if in fact we could reach an agreement on time limits. And, and I was prepared under those uh, agreements uh, to have the minority choose such amendments as they wanted to offer rather than have the Rules Committee uh, do that. That uh, offer was rejected, as the gentleman knows. Uh, it was re rejected relatively emphatically by uh, Mr. Boehner in a meeting in my office attended by Mr. Lewis, Mr. Obey, Mr. Boehner, and myself. Um, now, Mr. Obey, you quote Mr. Obey. In uh, November of 06, the American public decided that uh, they wanted to change the leadership in the House and the Senate. They did so. Mr. Obey took over as chairman of the committee, as he had been chairman in years past. Uh, Mr. Obey brought 10 bills to the floor under open rules of the 12 bills. We did so under the understanding that you would give to us exactly what we gave to you under time agreements. Notwithstanding that, we debated those bills for 50 hours longer than the time constraints that we had agreed in 06 with you the year before when you were in charge of the House of Representatives. So Mr. Obey concluded, and I did as well, that those time agreements would not be honored and were not honored. Now, I know there's a disagreement uh, between uh, your side and our side as to why they weren't honored, but there is no disagreement that they took 50 hours longer to consider those bills uh, than uh, was the case in 06. Now, having said that, we then went to uh, rules. I offered uh, an agreement some three and a half months ago that was rejected. Uh, we then went uh, to the bills, and we've gone to markups. Now, we had a markup uh, just the other day uh, in committee on the financial services bill and one other bill. What was the other bill? One other bill, uh, energy and water. Uh, and uh, that uh, there were some, I'm not sure exactly, number of amendments that were offered most of which were not germane to the bills. Uh, and that markup took until uh, after 1 a.m. in the morning on non-germane amendments. So uh, you and I have been discussing 
trying to come to grips with time constraints. But I will tell you that uh, time constraints, and, and you've indicated, uh, trust us on good faith. Uh, I tried to get some indication what a good faith mean, what criteria could I judge good faith on. We haven't reached agreement on that. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that during the CGS debate on the rule, uh, Mr. Lewis was asked on the bill that came to the floor under an open rule, um, Mr. Lewis said this after being asked, can we reach a time agreement? Uh, he said, because of that, referring to uh, uh, the 127 amendments, et cetera, et cetera, that were preprinted in the bill, 104 of which were Republican amendments. Uh, now, under an open rule, of course, uh, as the gentleman well knows, uh, which, by the way, he serves on a committee, of course, that hardly ever reports its bills under an open rule. Hardly ever. Hardly ever does a bill come out of Ways and Means Committee that has an open rule. It's closed. You guys decide what to do. You bring the bill to the floor, say take it or leave it. Now, here's what Mr. Lewis said in response to that question. I think the time limitation you were discussing was like for eight hours or something, which is essentially what the bill took in the year in 2006 when you were in charge. I'm afraid my conference might very well have a resolution revolution on its hands, and you might have a new ranking member in response to could he agree to time constraints. So I tell my friend that uh, he is right. Uh, I tried to reach uh, an agreement uh, where we could have uh, uh, a time agreement, and you would offer such amendments as you deem to be uh, appropriate within the time uh, frame uh, agreed upon. Unfortunately, we didn't reach such agreement. I talked to Mr. Obie about that. I talked to the Speaker about that. I believe that had we reached agreement, we would have proceeded uh, on that course. Now, that does not mean, because we didn't proceed on that course, that I don't want to continue discussing it. I want to assure the gentleman of that, uh, because I believe that uh, uh, the more open our debate is, uh, the better uh, we are. The gentleman's correct when he characterizes my feeling as that. Uh, but uh, it has to be within the context of uh, uh, being able to get the American people's work done in a timely right. fashion. I know the gentleman has indicated he agrees with that. So that, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, in 2007, the last time we really did appropriation bills, we didn't do them last year, again, because uh, uh, extraneous amendments were offered to, uh, to uh, uh, a number of the bills and appropriations committee, and we didn't move ahead on those, as you did not move ahead in some of uh, your years. I think that was, from my standpoint, unfortunate. But uh, I tell the gentleman in closing that I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, as we move ahead, we can do so uh, uh, perhaps through agreement. Uh, now, in terms of Mr. Obie, Mr. Obie is the chairman of the committee. Mr. Obie and Mr. Lewis have talked. They have not reached agreement. Uh, as Mr. Lewis indicated, he could not. Uh, and, uh, frankly, the subcommittee uh, chairman have not reached agreement. Uh, I'm sure that the gentleman understands, as a majority leader, I'm, I'm very concerned about what the chairman, uh, both the committee and the subcommittee, feel in terms of how their bills are handled on the floor, and we try to accommodate them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, back. Mr. Speaker I, and I thank the gentleman. Uh, and, listen, I, he and I have talked about ways and means, and, again, he and I both agree as far as the duty of this House to deliberate on appropriations bills, the precedent has always been, by and large, for open rules. We have diverted from that precedent wholly at this point, and we're just trying to see if we can return back to some open and full debate around the bills. So I hear the gentleman, and as he properly says, accurately reflects discussions that have on, gone, gone on between a variety of individuals. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the gentleman has asked for us to commit, uh, and he wants to know what is reasonable and fair and what our good faith means. So I would respond to the gentleman by saying this. Because we were unable to fulfill the re full return to the precedence of the House, although I do think that the gentleman from Maryland would like to, because Mr. Obie has seen to get his way in shutting out the millions of American people, I will sit here and tell the gentleman that in consultation with our leader, John Boehner, as well as the ranking member, Jerry Lewis, 
we are committed to fulfilling his, the leader's desire to finish the appropriations bills in a timely manner, but with full and open ability of our side to discuss the issues that we and our constituents feel should be discussed. So I would ask the gentleman, is he in the position to readily accept at this point the ability for our side to have 20 amendments, 20 amendments, and give our side 10 minutes on each amendment to discuss those? That's a fair and good faith proposition, largely divergent from the precedents of this House, but in trying to meet the majority's desire to do what it can, the minority then <laughs> proffers uh, this offer, and I yield to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I'll certainly have a discussion uh, uh, with that. Uh, it sounds to me a little bit like the offer that I made uh, three and a half months ago, uh, so I certainly am going to consider it in light of the fact it sounds a lot like the offer I made. And I will uh, uh, be in further discussions with the gentleman. All right. I thank the gentleman. And at this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield to the ranking member of the Rules Committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer. Thank my friend for yielding. And I, uh, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that um, as I listen to the very thoughtful remarks coming from my friend, the distinguished majority leader, I'm reminded that he came to Congress just a few months after I came in 1980. And I'm reminded how we stood here on opposite sides engaging in the first um, – Oxford-style debate, if you recall, uh, Mr. Speaker, if the gentleman recalls uh, on the issue of trade policy being used to enforce human rights. That was the discussion we had two decades ago. And uh, I simply put that forward, Mr. Speaker, in an attempt to, to underscore the fact that we are both institutionalists. We both served nearly three decades here, and we feel strongly about this institution and about the responsibility that we have to the American people. And um, I, I know that my friend understands full well that if one looks at the Constitution and the precedents that have been set in the past, there is a clear differentiation between the uh, Ways and Means Committee's work and the Appropriations Committee's work. And there's also clearly an understanding of the disparity between the notion of opening up the tax code to uh, a completely open amendment process and dealing with the appropriations process through an open amendment process, which has for 220 years been the case, with some exceptions. The interesting thing about those exceptions, and I know we've had both private discussions and we're engaging in public discussion now, and I thank my, my friend the distinguished uh, Republican whip for yielding to me. One of the things that I believe has not been tried, I know has not been tried in this process, is to allow uh, not the top elected leaders of the party to make these kinds of decisions, not even the chairman and ranking member of the full committee. But uh, just to report to my, to my friends here, Mr. Speaker, in the Rules Committee yesterday, we had uh, an opportunity, or earlier this week, I guess it was day before yesterday, we had an opportunity here from the distinguished chair of the Agriculture Subcommittee, Ms. DeLauro, and the ranking member of that committee, Mr. Kingston. And uh, recognizing that there has been difficulty, recognizing that sometimes the appropriation process has, as my friend correctly has said, uh, seen members engage in dilatory practices, um, Mr. Kingston made it clear that if we were to have an open amendment process, that he would do everything within his power to uh, ensure that shenanigans would not take place on our side of the aisle, that could delay the process. Because we all acknowledge that we want to get the work done. Mr. Cantor has said that. Mr. Lewis has said that. We very much want that to take place. What we're arguing is that if you, if you look at when we have had structured rules in the past, they have in almost every instance followed the inability of the subcommittee chair and ranking member to successfully propound a unanimous consent agreement. And so while Mr. Cantor has just made an offer, I, I would like to uh, I mean, I, I frankly believe that we should do everything we can to at least attempt, just take one of the appropriations bills and see if not the majority leader and the Republican whip or the Republican leader and the speaker or whatever, you know, the, 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 the top elected positions within our party, but rather let the subcommittee chairman uh, make an attempt at doing that. And I say that, Mr. Speaker, because um, as we look at even the notion of what we began with, which was what created the high level of frustration for us, and yesterday I did a dear colleague explaining this process, um, 
the notion of somehow having a pre-printing requirement does create uh, undue constraint on both Democrats and Republicans when it comes to the appropriations process. And that's what led to the over 100 amendments being filed because of the fact that when we consider the bill that we just passed an hour ago in this House last year, the unfortunate thing was there was no chance for even perfecting amendments to be offered to technical concerns that were there. And in light of that, uh, we felt very concerned about even having the pre-printing requirement. So my request would be, since we are now unfortunately having passed the five appropriations bills that we have, uh, we are, I guess it's six now that we've passed, six. the six as of this afternoon, we are unfortunately creating what I'm describing as the new norm. And I know that as an institutionalist, the majority leader would not like to see that continue. And I hope very much, Mr. Speaker, that we are able to at least make an attempt to embolden our, as has been the case in the past, our chairs and ranking members of the appropriations subcommittees who are expert on these bills to work on them and, and work with our colleagues on that. So I thank my friend for yielding, and I hope very much we could at least make that attempt on one bill as we move forward.